Hello, this lecture will cover pages 178 through 184 of my lecture notes. Please print those pages out and have them in front of you as I present this lecture on Chapter 12a, Variable Frequency Response Analysis with Bode Plots. We're going to start on page 178 and I want to point out that I want you to watch video 4a again. Video 4a was an introduction to operational amplifiers that we had a number of weeks back. But if you watch this video, it'll set you up perfectly for this chapter on variable frequency response analysis. Uh, as an introduction, we talked about this closed loop gain equation down here. We said that the closed loop gain of this block diagram up here, if you had negative feedback, we defined it as the output over the input, which was the forward loop gain whatever g of t was, divided by 1 minus the loop gain, which was the gain of this loop. Basically, that block times that block is the loop gain. And we defined it as something called t of s, some transfer function with respect to time. You're going to see in a minute that we're going to define it in terms of j omega with some complex frequency. And we're going to take it one step farther in this chapter. We're going to use the Laplace variable s, and we're going to define it in terms of s, where s is equal to the j omega. Very simple step from here to here that we can use. We don't have to get into a lot of math. s is simply equal to j omega. So make sure you look over video 4a before, before you really watch this video again. Continuing on. Now what we have is we're going to have a linear network made up of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. We already said that the input could be a function of time. You get the output of a function of time. It's sort of messy to work with the time equations. We moved into the frequency domain where the input was a function of j omega. The output was a function of j omega. The transfer function being the ratio would be a function of j omega. And we ended up with this frequency input and the response output. What we're gonna what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let S, uh, let s equal j omega, and we're gonna have x of s as the input, either voltage or current. We're gonna end up with the with the output response in terms of s. But let's go back and look in terms of t being in j omega is the closed loop transfer function, where we said x can be voltage or current. And the output can be either voltage or current. If you have voltage on the input, you don't necessarily get voltage on the output. If you have current on the input, you don't necessarily get current on the output. Let's talk about it down here. If we let the input be x and we let the output be y, we just form the ratio of output over input. And we call that the transfer function, t. Very simple variables here to work with. So we're going to have x as an input. We're going to have y as an output. We're going to have the transfer function, which is the ratio of the two. So what if current is the input and you monitor voltage as the output? We form the ratio, you get impedance. So they refer to that T of S in that case as a transfer impedance. What if you have voltage on the input and current on the output? Form that ratio, you get admittance. We call that a transfer admittance function in this block up here. What if you have current on the input? These last two is what you're more familiar with. Current on the input, current on the output, it's a voltage gain. It's a current gain. And sometimes they show it like this. Sometimes they show it like that. That's a current gain, obviously, dimensionless. What if you have voltage on the input and voltage on the output? That's a voltage gain. Sometimes it's written like this. Sometimes it's written like that. There's your voltage gain. Keep in mind here, the values of x, y, and t okay, can be in terms of time, y of t and x of t, y of t and transfer function in terms of time, time domain. In the frequency domain, can be in terms of j omega, x of j omega, y of j omega, transfer function as a ratio, j omega. That's your frequency domain. And finally, using this Laplace variable, some of you may be aware of at this point, but if you don't understand Laplace functions, don't worry about it. S is simply j omega. So you have x of s as the input. 
y of s is the output and the transfer function of the ratio is t of s it's in the complex frequency domain where the complex frequency variable is s before we continue on I want to mention filters here electronic filters I have a definition here electronic filters are circuits which perform signal processing functions specifically to remove unwanted frequency components from the sig uh, signal to enhance the ones you want or to do both electronic filters can be passive or active or they can even be analog or digital but let's take a look here we're going to have a low pass filter a low pass filter allows the low frequencies to pass so here we have a i have a number of frequencies out here i'm only showing one two three four five frequencies but there could be hundreds of frequencies on the input and these frequencies are all coming in at the same time and what are we going to get out well on a low pass filter it'll pass frequencies below a certain frequency so in this case i'm saying every frequency lower than this frequency it's going to pass these higher frequencies does not allow through that's called a low pass filter and the characteristics of the low pass filter look like this we're going to show in this ordinate axis the absolute value of the voltage gain and we're going to show it in terms of decibels so you're going to be using the db equation that we've been working with throughout the semester so this is going to be in terms of db and this is frequency in this horizontal axis here and notice that the response characteristics of an of a circuit to frequency gain versus the frequency as the frequency gets higher and higher it'll pass frequencies below a certain frequency we're going to call f prime so anything from f prime whatever that value is it'll pass from 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 very low frequencies up to that frequency it'll pass it with a, i made an example here with a gain of 10 and then it attenuates it or it cuts them off above that frequency now it doesn't cut it off abruptly you can't design circuits that cut it off sharply and comes out it has to be a gradual 20 db per decade 40 db per decade 60 db per decade roll off but that's the characteristics of a low, characteristics of a low pass filter it passes the low frequencies to the left of my pencil and it essentially kills the high frequency you don't get any gain at the higher frequencies at these higher frequencies here the gain gets diminished that's a low pass filter what about a high pass filter here it allows the high frequencies to pass here we have a series of frequencies all coming in here so let's say that we design that high pass filter so frequencies above this frequency will get passed through what does it look like with its response characteristics it looks like this again we're going to plot the absolute value of the gain 20 times the log of the absolute value of the gain we're going to get db in this axis and again i made an example it goes to 10. notice we have a particular frequency here which i'll show you how to calculate coming up in the next lecture well all the frequencies below that f prime are not allowed to pass in other words they have a very small gain again this can't this can't roll off abruptly it can't come over here with no gain and then all of a sudden jump up you can't design a circuit like that we're using practical elements so of, of r l and c so it rolls off so i'm showing it linear here but we'll talk about that coming up too but it it, it comes up to a particular point at, at f prime above all these frequencies get passed at the higher gain that's called a high pass filter and as you go higher and higher in frequency with the network the gain is the same it's 10 in this example but below that they dim they're diminished the gain gets diminished that's a high pass filter and what about a band pass filter a band pass filter allows a certain range of frequencies to pass so here we have again lots of frequencies i'm only showing five there could be a hundred out here they're coming into this network what we want to do in a band pass filter is we only want to pass certain frequencies here a range of frequencies and I'm picking this range here and that's what I'm going to pass what does it look like the response characteristic well the response characteristic of the band pass filter looks like this I want you to notice that 
it has two frequencies we have to look at, two cutoff frequencies we have to look at. It has a lower frequency, F sub L, and it has a higher frequency. So you diminish all the frequencies below F sub L, doesn't allow them to pass. You diminish all the frequencies above F sub H, the high frequency point, doesn't allow those to pass, but it allows frequencies to pass between F L and F H. That's called the bandwidth. A good example of that is if you're designing a stereo amplifier. Humans can't hear below 10 hertz, so you design so the FL is 10 hertz and the higher frequency is 20 kilohertz. Because that's the highest frequency most humans can hear. Low frequency is 10 hertz, the higher frequency is 20 kilohertz. So you design a filter that looks like that. Why put all the money into components to amplify these frequencies down here at a real high dB whenever humans can't hear them? And why put all the, the money into real expensive components at this higher frequency above 20 kilohertz where humans can't hear it? So we're only concerned about from this point to this point. Now it turns out you can't find that point right at the top and you can't find that point at the top. So what we're going to define is 3 dB points, 3 dB down, no matter what this maximum dB is. I made it 100 here. So they come down 3 dB, and they call that a 3 dB point here. You can find a 3 dB point real easy. Just find the maximum dB gain, subtract 3 from it, and you have a lower 3 dB point here. This is the actual, actual point that you want to look at for F sub L. It's 3 dB down, so we're going to move it out to here. This is the actual point you want to define, 3 dB down at the higher one. And then you go between this point and this point, and that gives you your bandwidth. So the bandwidth is defined as the higher frequency minus the lower frequency, and it's measured in hertz. But we don't use the ideal points here and here. We come down 3 dB, and this is an equation that I want you to, to have handy. The bandwidth in a bandpass filter is the higher frequency measured at the 3 dB point, which is here, minus the lower frequency measured at the 3 dB point, which is here, and that defines your bandwidth in hertz. Now, I will add that when you're talking about these 3 dB points, why did they pick 3 dB? Well, it turns out the human ear can't detect changes in volume less than 3 dB, the average. So, ideally, we'll say, a two, if a sound changes by 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9 dB, you can't hear it. Most human beings can hear a change in a sound's intensity if it changes by 3 dB. So they pick 3 dB points. That's how, they didn't arbitrarily choose that. So that's why they get the 3 dB points that are down from the maximum. So we talked about the three different types of filters. We talked about the low pass. We talked about the high pass. We talked about the band pass. I gave you the response characteristics of the low pass, of the high pass, and finally of the, of the band pass. Now, what makes these filters active or passive? Well, if you can get a gain out of the circuit, which I showed here, if you can get a gain out of the circuit, which I'm showing there, if you can get a gain out of the circuit, which I'm showing there, it has to be an active filter. It has to have some active element in it, like an operational amplifier or transistor circuit, to be able to give you that gain. But you'll find out in passive filters, the best you can do is pass the signal that's coming in to the signal out. That's the best you can do. The highest gain you can get is one. Okay. So 20 times the log of one, 0 dB. So you're going to have 0 dB right there. You'd have 0 dB here. And you'd have 0 dB here. When you're working with passive filters. So I want you to remember that. You'll see that coming up. Some filter applications. An audio filter is a frequency dependent amplifier circuit working on the audio frequency range of 0 hertz to beyond 20 kilohertz. Well, I just went over that. Yeah, I called it 
10, kilo, 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz. There's a line filter. I want you to read about the line filter. There's a bandpass filter that's used in all kinds of instrumentation, as well as seismology, sonar, even medical applications. Even your telephone service uses bandpass filters. The audio side is roughly that frequency. And the digital side for your computer is much higher. If you get DSL, technicians install bandpass filters to split the digital signals and the audio signals so the audio don't interfere with the digital signals of the computer. That's done with a filter, an equalizer. Is a circuit or equipment used to achieve equalization. It's a sound or volume or, or vocals equalizer in music. What about an audio mixer? It's used to combine multiple sounds into one or more channels. So read through these. These are all applications of, of filters. That's why this chapter is so important. Frequency analysis. How a network responds to different frequencies is very important in electrical engineering. So basically, we're going to have a network here made up of R, L, and C elements. And by choosing different values of R, L, and C, we can get different frequency characteristics to allow certain frequencies to go through, to block certain frequencies. So this transfer function is going to be in terms of the complex frequency, J omega. So we're going to have the, the transfer function, which is just the ratio of this over this. You already know that. It's going to have a magnitude. Here's the magnitude. And it's going to have an angle associated with it in the complex, in the frequency domain. We're working with J omega here. Where the absolute value of this is simply equal to the magnitude in terms of omega. And the phase angle is in terms of omega. So the phase is going to change as the frequency changes too, you'll see. A representation of magnitude and phase can be plotted versus omega. When you, when you plot that, when you plot a representation of the magnitude here in terms of omega and the frequency phase shift in terms of omega, that's called a Bode plot. That's called a Bode plot, particularly when you do it on semi-log paper. And you'll see why in the next lecture. All we're going to do is we're going to define the transfer function in terms of the compact, complex variable S. Well, remember, S is simply equal to the J omega. That, that's all you have to remember here. S is equal to J omega. So we're replacing the j omega with s. So our transfer functions are going to be in t of s. And we're going to work everything out with the complex in the complex frequency domain. And then we're going to we're going to relate it to the time domain and you'll see how it relates. The math is a lot easier when we work in the complex frequency domain. Here are a few of the examples below of these plots, of these type of plots, these Bode plots we're going to be doing. I did a couple examples here. So you can look at that and see that's a low pass filter. You can see at the lower frequencies, you're getting a gain of 100 dB. That's a, that's a high gain up to a certain point. And we're going to calculate a 3 dB point down there at that point, And it starts cutting off here. It starts cutting the, the gain as the frequencies goes higher. Don't forget, you can't just cut it off with a discontinuity at an infinite slope because you're using realistic components here. And as long as you have R, L, and C to do this, you, you have to rule it off gracefully. And this rule off is going to be, you'll see 20 dB per decade or 40 dB per decade or 60 dB per decade. The higher you go, the, the sharper the, the negative slope there. Here's another one. It's a Bode plot. In this case right here, I'm showing not only the magnitude here in dB. In this case, let's make it voltage gain in dB. And this is the phase. So what this is telling me is it's a high pass filter. It rules everything off from a 3 dB point. They're even showing it here. On the lower frequencies, but everything above that, you get a you get a gain. 
Well, I want you to notice the gain you're getting. You're getting 0 dB. 0 dB means it's a passive filter, not an active filter, because it could be an active filter with a gain of 1. You might want to have an active filter with a gain of 1. It could be passive or active, depending upon if it uses transistors or just an RC circuit. But in this case right here, it's passing the pass band or the frequencies above this 3 dB point. This is not a band pass filter. I don't like the terminology there. They're saying the pass band of frequencies are everything above that 3 dB. That's a high pass filter. And look what the phase shift is doing. At these lower frequencies, you're 90 degrees out of phase. And it gracefully goes through a 45 degree and it reaches zero phase shift. So at the higher frequencies, you do not have a phase shift between input and output. What that's saying is, if, if you're looking at this, at these higher frequencies, if this were an input, let me just do this. If that were an input, let's see what the output would do. The output would be directly in phase with that. It would be in phase at the higher frequencies because there's no phase shift. And at the, at the lower frequencies, you'll see it'll be 90 degrees out of phase, where this will be shifted, the output will be shifted 90 degrees. That's a plus 90 degrees, so it's, it shifts over here. Remember, this is the plus angle here. So this waveform gets shifted in this direction, where that here is 90 degrees. And you're going to be able to take a look on these Bode plots, and we're going to be able to get a magnitude response versus frequency and a phase response versus frequency where we can pick any frequency here. And we can not only find at any frequency, we can not only find the dB gain, but we can also find the phase shift. At this frequency here, we could find, we'll be able to do that, find of gain there, we'll be able to find the phase shift. At this frequency, here, we'll be able to find the gain, and we'll be able to find what the phase shift is at this point. That's going to be real important to do that. And you don't have to do a lot of math, because even though these curves roll off gracefully, even though these are all graceful roll-offs here, we can approximate them with linear lines with straight line approximations and it's extremely accurate. The process of analyzing frequency response with straight line approximations on semi-log paper is referred to as Bode plots and we'll be discussing that in the next lecture. And then finally, we look at a single component here. These are real easy, just to give you a reference here. A, a resistor plot. If that's a pure resistor, we know the impedance is purely real. It has a magnitude of R at an angle of zero. Well, here's the plots. The magnitude of the impedance with a pure resistor doesn't change with frequency. I don't care what the frequency is. The resistor is still going to be R. It's constant. And what about the phase angle? There's no phase angle there. It's zero degrees because it's purely real. What about the inductor plots? Well, we know the impedance of an inductor is made up of a, of a magnitude, Z, which we called inductive reactance, X sub L. That's the magnitude and an angle. And the angle is always 90 degrees because it's J. Remember? Remember I said the impedance of a pure inductor was equal to J X sub L. We talked about that before. So that leads the impedance if it's purely inductive to be omega L, that's your X sub L, at an angle of 90, that's your J. What does it look like? Well, as frequency, it's linear. As frequency increases, the value of this magnitude of X sub L is linear, but it increases. It's directly proportional to omega. What about the phase angle? The phase angle is always 90 degrees. It's not dependent with frequency. So for pure inductor, it's always going to be 90 degrees out of phase. We talked about that before as you change the frequency. So what does this say here? For a resistor, as omega gets larger, as the frequency, 
Don't forget now, omega is equal to 2 pi f. We're going to work with omega here on, we're going to start working with omega here on these plots, but omega is equal to 2 pi f. So as omega gets larger and larger, the resistor doesn't change, the value, the resistance doesn't change, and the angle stays zero. If you take a look at this, as omega gets larger and larger, this is what the value of x sub l does. It gets larger and larger too, directly proportional. Directly proportional with frequency right here. And what does the angle do? The angle is independent of frequency. It's always 90 degrees. For a capacitor and RLC plots, you can take a look in your textbook, whatever page it is in your textbook. I'm not too concerned about that, but if you're looking at a capacitor or RL or C plots, you can see what they look like. And that concludes this lecture.